Hi folks, so this week's lab, Lab 9, Arena 5, is a lab where we are going to practice with some of the concept and, and tools that have been brought up in uh, Unit J uh, on output analysis or estimating performance from these simulations, from these stochastic simulation models. So the first thing we need to cover is just a reminder of the different types of simulations the two major types of simulations and how they model two sort of major types of systems. And so the first type of system we talk about are these terminating systems. So these are systems where we are interested in a trajectory from a specified start point all the way to a specified end point and everything in between. And so we're not just interested in how the system settles down over time, we're interested in everything about it. So how long does it take to settle down? Um, how do, what is the experience like during the um, transient period after the initial conditions, et cetera. And so, for example, if a bank opens at, I don't know, 8 a.m. and it is totally empty, customers start to come into the bank, and so we might notice that queue lengths start to increase, and maybe later on in the morning they reach some steady state that they hold on to for most of the rest of the day, and then they end at, uh, you know, whenever the bank closes, five or six o'clock in the evening, and you might think that you might only care about this kind of steady state Q characteristics, but perhaps you actually do care about what the experience was like uh, while things were ramping up. Maybe you simply care about how long it takes for things to ramp up. Maybe you want to change when the bank opens, etc. And so when you care about these transients, then you simulate the transients and you make use of those transients and thus these are transient simulations. So terminating systems, systems that have a designated end time and a designating start time, or a condition that allow, that, that, um, that is, it may not be a time, but it could be a condition of the system where it is clear the system is going to stop running or we're gonna stop caring about it after that point. Uh, then those are these terminating systems and we simulate them with the transient simulations. Now statistically speaking there's really only one thing that we care about with these simulations and that's how many replications do we need to run? How many times do we need to simulate these transient simulations for us to get enough statistical power to say something interesting about the terminating system? And so we will uh, basically uh, run some pilot runs of some transient simulations in order to estimate the variance in an output. And once we know the variance in that output, we can then go ahead and decide how many more simulation runs do we need to run in order to reduce our confidence intervals to something sufficiently small for us to make an inference that is useful. So that's our focus for those types of systems. The other types of systems are the non-terminating systems. These are systems where we do not view them as having a designated start point and end point. We view them as just sort of constantly running. And so these systems, uh, when we simulate them, we have to start them somewhere and we have to end our simulations somewhere. So we start them somewhere and they may have a transient period where our initial conditions, our initial Q lengths are equal to zero, for example. We originally, we originally have no customers or no parts in the system. There's the width is equal to zero initially. And so, uh, but we may not care about how the whip rises, but we may care about where the whip settles out to be over time. And if we did end up bringing in these transients, then what's gonna happen is the thing we care about, which is this steady state value up here, is going to be pulled down by all of this extra junk transient data that we don't care about. And so our estimated behavior will be lower than it should be. And that difference between the estimated behavior and the actual behavior we're trying to estimate is, uh, is referred to as bias. And so we would like to remove the bias that's due to including these transients. So how do we do that? We create a warm-up period where we do not start paying attention to the data until after this warm-up period has passed. And so that's what's being shown here. And then we also need to decide how much data after the warm-up to collect 
in order for these good data to be able to add, be aggregated together to estimate properly this, um, this steady state performance variable. And so those are the things that we care about. We also care about how many replications. So once we decide on our warm-up period, how much data to throw away and how long to run the simulation after the warm-up period to get enough data to estimate this steady state, then uh, we need to then say, well, then how many times do we rerun this process? Now, an interesting aspect of these is every time you rerun these simulations, you throw away data. So it might take, uh, let's say it takes an hour to run your simulation. It might take 10 minutes of that hour just to get rid of these transients. And so if you have to run 50 of the replications, every replication is going to pay that 10 minute cost. So it would be nice if we could manage to get the same benefit of running many replications without having to pay the cost of this warm-up period every single replication. And so what we do, or what we can do, and the book gets into this, but it's a little dicey to, to figure out um, you know, exactly how to do it right, but we can run a steady state simulation we can run it for very, very, very long, much, much, much longer than we ever would think we need to run it if we're running for a single replication. And if we run it for very, 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 very long, and then we cut it into pieces, so we can say the first 10% of that very long simulation, the second 10% of that uh, very long simulation, and so on and so forth, each 10% chunk of the steady state simulation will itself be as long as one of our replicates. And so we can average across those 10% to get a single average. And then we can average across the second 10% to get another average and so on and so forth. And as long as each chunk that we're averaging across is large enough, then hopefully the averages we get from each chunk or each batch, each batch mean will be uncorrelated from the next batch mean. Because the last thing we want is for one batch mean to help us predict what the next batch mean is going to be, because then we don't have independent replications. So if possible, uh, if we, if possible, it's always better to just run fresh replications. But if you really are, I, I don't have the time budget, the computational budget to throw away this warm-up period every single time, you can throw away the warm-up period once run your steady state very, 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 very long, and then cut that extra long steady state up into pieces. And it turns out that Arena does that for you. If you were to run a single replication really, 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 really long, and you can define a warm-up period as well, if it's really, really long, Arena will try to figure out the best batch length and it will then um, calculate these batch means and then use these batch means to better estimate the variance in your steady state data. Because uh, you can only really estimate variance if you know that your samples of your data, if these batch means uh, are uncorrelated. And so it will try to do that batch mean stuff for you, but there also are facilities inside the output analyzer where you can manually do this if you'd like. All right, so I don't want to spend too much more time talking about that, but the book will also talk about that. Uh, and our lab exercise, we're not going to talk so much about the, the batch means, but I do want you to read that section because it's right sort of in the middle of the section that uh, goes into what we will worry about with, uh, in the lab exercise for these non-terminating systems and steady state sims. All right, so lab nine. So this lab uh, is separated into two parts. Uh, one part will be a part focusing on terminating simulations or terminating systems and uh, their transient simulations of them. The second part is we're going to actually then uh, look at a system that is a non-terminating system simulated by a steady state sim. And so in the first part, the real focus will be finding enough replications to get your confidence intervals down to a narrow enough uh, 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 size. And then in the second part, it will be also choosing the appropriate size of that warm-up period, and then also choosing the number of replications. So uh, upload your results as a Word document, a doc or a docx file, and then uh, preferably, if you can, uh, also upload a PDF version that ends up helping us with grading on Canvas.
All right, so let's get into it. Now, you'll need to use the output analyzer for both of these parts. The output analyzer is found on older versions of Windows. If you go to the Start menu, go to Rockwell Software, go to Arena, then you should find something that says Output Analyzer or Output Processor. Uh, both of those are the same uh, program, but depending on your version of uh, Arena, then you, know, you might see one or the other. On newer versions of Windows, you can go and you can hit that Windows key and go into Windows Search or Cortana or whatever it's called at the time in which you're watching this video. And then you can type in Output Analyzer or maybe Output Processor and see what you get. Now, I'm on a Mac, so it looks a little bit different here, but what I uh, will do here is um, maybe I'll go into Arena just to demonstrate to you that under the Tools menu, there is no Output Analyzer under the Tools menu. But if I go down and click on the equivalent of a Windows uh, button, it brings up uh, you know, the standard what you see with Windows Search. And if I were to click on the Search button here and type in Output, uh, then it brings up Output Analyzer. And so um, on some of yours, you might see Output Processor. Um, if I type that in on this system, I don't think know if anything else will come up, but Output Analyzer is what I'm looking for. So if I click on that, it'll bring up this relatively bare bones program, very similar to the Input Analyzer. So uh, I will get into that a little bit more uh, in a second here, but that is how you open that program up. All right, so let's go back into here. And so part one. So for part one, we're going to revisit a model that uh, we've seen before, the call center model. And so uh, this model uh, I've already got loaded back here in Arena. So if you remember from this one, it's a relatively complicated model where uh, calls arrive. I mean, it's effectively a queuing network model, but the service times for the queue for the for the queuing system are much more complicated because they get broken up and sent off to different places and there's lots of conditions. And there's uh, the resources that are behind those services are have all sorts of cross training. And so some of them can handle some types of uh, demand and, and not others and um, so on and so forth. And so it's a relatively complex model uh, and it is a, we, you might think a call center sounds like something that might be a non-terminating because you might think, well, a call center, maybe it's open 24 hours a day because it's servicing the world or whatever, but this is like a call center that's servicing a one time zone. So if we go into run and setup, then it brings up this and we see that we're right, right now it's configured to run. Um, and I don't know if yours be configured this by default, but at least mine, and it might be because I've changed it, is, uh, is set to run five replications. And I look down here, the base time units are minutes. And if I look at replication length, you say, ah, it says infinite. This is a 24 hour call center, but you have to look a little more closely because there's this thing called terminating condition. So this shows that we can have transient simulation models of terminating systems that don't end necessarily at an exact time, but they end at a condition. And what is the condition? T now, that is Arena's way of saying the current time or the time since the beginning of the simulation. If the time since the simulation started is greater than 600 minutes and the number of entities in the queue of the trunk line is equal to zero, then and only then will the simulation stop. So basically, if you got a slow day, if hardly anybody is calling in, then this simulation will stop right at 600 minutes. But if there are people waiting in the queue, waiting in that trunk line, then the system, the call center stays open for however long it takes for you to clear them out. In fact, that might be one of your interesting performance variables is how long does it take for us to clear this queue at the end of the day? How many days do we actually end when we were supposed to end and how many days do we have to stay open and how much longer do we have to stay open? So that's something that you could look into. All right, so that's what makes this a terminating simulation. Now, uh, so our big question will be how many replications to run. So how do we get data out of Arena? 
And so if I were to run this thing, so if I were to just hit run on this, then the simulation runs and I get all this gray animation. You see people running around and all that, but it takes forever, right? And so we can scroll through, we can make it go slower or faster. We can even hit this fast forward and that's fine. The fast forward gets it to run a little bit faster, but if we really want this thing to run fast, then what I do is I go to run and I go down to run control and I click on batch run and it looked like nothing happened there but if I go to run run control and under batch run this little fast forward icon here is now got a square around it meaning that I am in batch run mode now in batch run mode if I hit play then uh, almost immediately it finishes no animation it's much faster than even fast forward and so that really is the way to make these fast simulations run very fast. It has already run five replications. I know that because if I look down here in the, this, um, in the, the bar down here, it says five slash and normally there'd be a time there because they're in batch run, it doesn't keep track of the time. So it's run five replications of these things. It says, do you want to see the results? Now, I could go and say, see the results, sure. And that will bring up my report screen. And depending on, uh, you know, there's .NET incompatibilities in some versions of Windows, and so some people have trouble bringing up the category overview. Hopefully it works out for you. Um, if it doesn't, I'm gonna show you a way that uh, you can still get all the information out of the category overview without having to actually open the category overview. But I can see here that it has all of these different statistics that are in this report. And in the category overview, they have been aggregated across these replications. And so when I look at the, um, say, under counter on these period uh, one rejected calls, there's um, maybe a period four rejected calls, there's an average of five rejected calls with a half width a 95% confidence interval half width of 6.2. Um, it's got, and it is this funny word, it says minimum average, maximum average. What they're saying is that there are five numbers period uh, from these rejected calls, and um, or there are five replications, and they each have a period five rejected calls, and they each have an average. And so there are five averages that that the reports are dealing with here in the category overview and this is telling you the minimum average and the maximum average and then this confidence interval is defined over those five numbers so if i were to go to category by replication then i end up seeing those five numbers so i could go to call center module there are my five replications if i click on replication one um, and then i can um, you know click on these on a user specified counter and under this counter here, let's go to count, um, and I can now see period five rejected calls. Uh, so here there's 37. And so what it's saying is that for this replication, there were 37 rejected calls in period five. And so there's a single number per replication. And in the category overview, it took that number from replication one, two, three, four, and five, and it averaged those and made a little confidence interval out of it. All right, so um, what if your category overview isn't working for you, or what if you want to do some processing of these data yourself? Well, fortunately, you go up to Tools, and you can say Export Summary Statistics to CSV File. And then from here, Report Database. Well, there, I just end up looking in the same folder as that model, and I find that model.accdb, think access db. And that, uh, that will bring that database in. And then I say, what CSV file do I want out? And, uh, and so you can edit this file name or take whatever name it gives you. And if I click OK there, it then exports a CSV file. And if I were then to go and open that CSV file, so um, let me see if I can find where I've dumped that one for this demo, which is right here, I think. So if I were to open that into Excel, then what it will give me is all of the replication level data. So um, I can find my period five rejected calls, which I've been focusing on here. And then these, if I wanted to, I could then take uh, you know, averages uh, across these numbers. 
and I could then even generate confidence intervals. So you could then do a 95% confidence interval um, here, and so you could basically regenerate everything that the category overview does for you because you've got all of the replication level data. So that's one way to get the data out. But like I was saying, the output analyzer is, is, is there to hopefully make this easier for you. And so for that, uh, basically I have to go back into the model and so I'll go back to this model here. And if I look under advanced process and then go under statistic, then I find all of these statistics. And so these have been defined for this model. So as I go uh, down here, I've got percent rejected. So if I were to right click on that, maybe if I were to right click on this percent rejected and say edit via dialog, or if I were to double click on that row, brings up a dialog here. It says I have a statistic that I'm calling percent rejected. This is an output statistic. So what an output statistic is, is it is a statistic that only operates at the end of a replication. And then at the end of that replication, it then calculates whatever's in this expression. This expression basically has a, a count of the total number of rejected calls, and it has a count of the total attempted calls. It has the ratio of the total rejected divided by attempted, and then it multiplies by 100 just to turn it into a percent. And then that will end up showing up in that report, but if I want to then kick it out to a data file that I can analyze in the output analyzer, then under this output file here, then I can end up putting up, uh, I can say like percent rejected dot dat, and use that dot dat extension uh, in order, because the output analyzer will be expecting it. If I click on these three little dots over here, I can choose where to put that. Uh, otherwise, I think it'll just put it in the same folder as the model. And then if I were to click OK there, and if I were to rerun this thing, remember batch runs are on, so it's going to finish almost instantaneously. And so it'll say, would I like to see the results? I can say no. And then I can go into my output analyzer, which I think I still have running, Arena Output Processor. And in the output analyzer, there's this file menu, which is going to be useless for most of the cases that we'll deal with. So as you get more advanced, you might have reason, ways, reasons that you might want to create sort of a, a new analysis document. Um, there's data files, so you can import data from other sources and turn them into these DAT files. You can take these DAT files and export them as text files. And so, in fact, one of the exercises in the lab is going to have you do that. But uh, most of the time, we just focus on graph and analyze. So under graph and analyze, we can pull in data and we can either take a look at it. So we can do plots of things over time, see bar charts, histograms, et cetera. And then under analyze, we can uh, do t-tests, we can do ANOVAs. Uh, or we can just generate confidence intervals. And so for a confidence interval on mean, I can select classical, and, um, and this is normally blank, and so I can say, well, I'm going to click add, and I'll pull in a data set. So I'm going to pull in my percent rejected data set. Now those data, uh, I can, under replications, if this was not an output data set, like let's say it was a tally data set, so in a tally data set, at the end of one replication, I might have the data for, say, 100 entities. And so I know that 100 entities ran through that replication. They each one have something interesting that I recorded, like the amount of time that they waited for service. And so I can take those 100 data points for that single replication, and I could do a confidence interval on them. And I might want to run, uh, have multiple confidence intervals. I might want to see, well, what did replication one's confidence interval look like versus replication two and so on. And so I can either plot a single replication or I could select all. And if I were to select all, it will then show me confidence intervals for every replication. Now that's not going to be good for this percent uh, data. If I were to do that, then basically it shows me uh, five confidence intervals, one per replication. But, uh, and I'm sorry about the, the size here, this is sort of a problem with using, um, using parallels in this case, the, the resolution looks a little funny here, but I think you can see that there's one, two, three, four, five rows, each row has a confidence interval, and effectively the confidence interval is collapsed on a single point, because every replication only outputted one 
percent rejected. So it doesn't make sense for me to generate a confidence interval for every replication. It makes sense for me to pool all of those replications together and then take a confidence interval across these five points. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to then go up and say, I'll look at analyze, confidence interval on mean, classical, and I can then uh, delete that, or I guess I can click edit. And under replications, instead of saying all, I'll say lumped. And lumped just means take all of the data across the replications and generate a single data set. And so if I do that, then it shows me a confidence interval that actually has some width to it. And it shows down here, uh, it says the average percent rejected was 13.1, the standard deviation was 2.71, the 95% uh, half width is 3.36, the min value is 9.48, the max is 15.6, and I had five observations. So right there, I get a nice summary of all of those data across my five replications. If I went back and ran 50 replications, I could do this and it would calculate these things for me. So that's one example of what you can do in this output analyzer. Now what you'll end up doing in part two is you'll actually end up going and doing compare means, and that's where you can pull in multiple data files and do a paired t-test or a two sample t-test and you can adjust the confidence level um, if you hit down it'll show you some common ones but you could also type in your own confidence level like 0.975 for example and uh, and then you can put in like two data files like I can I can say hit add and it'll say data file a data file b so if I wanted to um, compare two data files uh, that um, so if I click, um, and I actually don't know if I've got some data files that are uh, adequate for this. Let me see if, say, cycle time one and cycle time two is an example of this. Um, and then I can say, well, I want to do maybe lumped again. So I'm going to lump all these things together. And if I were to do that, um, then it ends up showing me a t-test where the confidence interval displayed here um, goes from negative 1.47 all the way to minus 0.6. So zero is here. So because zero is outside of the confidence interval, then we know this is that, that these two groups, that these two data sets are statistically significantly different from each other. If zero was right in between it, then we could not reject the hypothesis that they were drawn from the same distribution. But at the 95% level, these two data sets happen to be different from each other. And that's why down here it says reject H0. Means are not equal at 0.05 level. And so uh, that right there tells me that you, whatever you did in simulation one that generated those replication data, uh, then uh, if you compare that to simulation two, then the performance measures are significantly different uh, between the two. So that is just uh, you know an out you know so those are sort of the things that you'll be playing with uh, is this compare means uh, maybe this confidence interval on mean uh, and then also under graph uh, you'll end up doing a plot for uh, for one of these uh, as well. So that's the output analyzer. Okay. So let's uh, go back to the PowerPoint and sort of keep on focus here. So uh, model 5.3, the call center model, uh, what I'm specifically asking you to do, can first go and read section 6.2 through 6.4 of the book um, on these transient simulations. And then I want you to go through and, uh, and after running the call center model, you'll hopefully then be able to estimate and report in your lab uh, uh, report the required sample size to obtain a half width of four on the total rejected calls. And so that's another statistic that you can find in there. So then you can implement that experiment with that number of samples and report the newly obtained confidence interval on total rejected calls. And, and then also report that confidence intervals uh, percent error relative to the sample average. So basically what we mean is the half width of the confidence interval is sort of the, the error in the confidence interval. And if you divide that by the average, which is the center of the confidence interval, then that gives you a number. And that sort of says that 
Um, you know, if a confidence interval is plus or minus an absolute value, then we're wondering what percent is that absolute value of the mid midpoint. So you could say, well, the average uh, percent um, or the average total rejected calls might be 42. And you'd say, oh, but it's plus or minus uh, 3%. And so uh, that would mean that 3% of 42 above and below 42, that's your 95% confidence interval. So in your report, we also then want you to duplicate a histogram that you'll find in section 6.3 with 1,000 replications. That histogram was generated actually with a weird process where they ran the SIM, took the data into the output analyzer, from the output analyzer, then generated a text file that they pulled into Excel and then massaged the data a little bit in Excel so that they could then pull it back into the input analyzer and then under the input analyzer generated a histogram. If you want, you can go through that whole process, but I don't like the histograms that come out of the input analyzer. So what I'd prefer you to do is just a fraction of that process. And so go into the output analyzer go to File, Data File, Export, as they talk about in the book, and output a, uh, a version of that data that ends in TXT, and then open it in Microsoft Excel, and say that it is a space delimited, delimited file. So it'll say, is this tab delimited? Is this com delimited? Say it's space delimited. And you should be able to get the data out of it. And then from there, I'm okay with you just generating a histogram in Excel and then formatting it nicely so that you, uh, you capture um, the essence of the shape of this thing. Now, if you read this section, the reason they do that histogram is to confirm that these data are normally distributed because you cannot use confidence intervals unless the data are normally distributed. And so you should try to confirm that as well when you look at your histogram. And then um, for section 6.4, uh, it goes into how to compare two different simulation models, one where you've made an intervention and the other one that's maybe a baseline model. And so it wants you to go in and then edit the, this uh, call center model so that you can see if you make any difference in your edits. And so they talk about different ways in which you can edit the call center, basically ways in which you can take resources up and down and then you can compare the outputs. Now, in this particular case, when you go into the output analyzer, it is okay to use a paired difference t-test. And that is because the callers that come into the both call centers, regardless of how you change the configuration, are basically going to be the same because the random seeds are going to be the same. And unless a lot of things change inside the simulation model, then most of the random numbers are going to be generated basically in the same way. And so it is actually probably more honest to use a paired difference t-test than a two sample t-test for this one. So then after you do all that, I want you to tell me what you changed, report your configuration, and then show me confidence intervals summarizing this t-test. And so when you run the paired difference t-test in the output analyzer, it will show you a confidence interval for uh, the, um, I forget if it shows you for the two populations or if it just shows you for the difference. It probably just shows you for the difference. And so then you need to sort of convince me that this uh, confidence interval doesn't capture zero or these two confidence intervals aren't overlapping and then maybe give me a p-value to sort of tell me uh, did this t-test tell you that your uh, your your two that your two models were different or did you end up not making much of a difference now uh, the last caveat that i'll mention for you is that they say that there are two response variables costs and number of rejected calls, total cost and total number of rejected calls. And so they say that you should do a separate t-test on both, which I'm okay with, but they then tell you that you should use a 95% confidence interval for both tests. And I'm claiming that that's incorrect and you need to, in the output analyzer, use a 97.5% confidence level for both and so um, for both comparisons and and it's specifically 97.5 because you're making two comparisons and so i'm asking you to then explain why when you're using two comparisons when you're saying these two models and i'm going to compare them in two different ways 
because you're comparing them in two different ways, why does the confidence level change? Um, and, um, and so if you remember our discussion in class, hopefully that will be make some sense. All right, so then speeding along here, part two. So part two, you're gonna open this small manufacturing system, which you may remember looks kind of like this. You've got all these, um, these transfer stations and material handling delays and all of that. So here's kind of a summary of all of that. And so we are using this as a steady state simulation. And so basically this, uh, we're saying this manufacturing system, it ends up having a whip uh, that changes over time and that whip is going to start artificially low and then we'll end up hitting some steady state value and we are only interested in that steady state value. So for this uh, here, I want you to go through and uh, replicate this whip warmup plot, which is actually plotted in the output analyzer. So you'll end up having to again going into the statistics module. Now for this one, uh, you'll have to follow section 7.2 because the statistic that they want you to plot for this total whip doesn't exist. And so you'll have to go into the statistics module and it'll be empty. You'll need to generate a new statistic for the total whip and, uh, and they'll tell you how to do that. You'll end up using the expression builder and you'll build that. And then you'll need to then set up a output data file and then from that output data file, we'll be able to read it into the, to the, the output analyzer and then plot it in the output analyzer. And I want to see that plot. And from that plot, using the logic that they sort of talk about in the book or maybe your own intuition, I want you to then tell me what your warm-up period is going to be. So how much data do you need to get rid of in these WIP in order for you to feel confident that if you averaged the rest of the WIP, you would get a good... Uh, uh, you would end up locating that kind of steady state whipped value. All right, so then after that, I want you to take that warm up period that you've inferred, go in and uh, into Arena, and go into the run setup, and then update the warm up period. And so this is the method of truncated replications. So you're going to generate many replications of this small factory system where each replication throws away your warm up period before keeping track of the data. Each replication will run for five days, and that includes your warm-up period. So don't add the five days to the warm-up period. Each replication produces a total whip. I want you to then report the average and standard deviation of these 10 total whips. So basically, the total whip is just going to happen at the end of the simulation, and you're going to get 10 numbers, and I want you to get the average and standard deviation across these 10. I want you to then also give me a 95% confidence interval across these 10. Using that 95% confidence interval, or actually using the standard deviation, you should be able to estimate how many total replications you need of this simulation model in order to reduce the half width to mo no more than 10% of the total average width. So basically up here, you're gonna have an estimated average you can calculate 10% of that estimated average, and that's gonna be the upper bound on your half width. And so you can use reread section 6.3, uh, or so, uh, look at some of the lectures that we've talked about in the half width formula, and you should then be able to use that to then calculate how many more replications you need, and then go back and update your run setup to run more replications, implement that solution, confirm that your half width has been desired, and then report both the 95% confidence interval, the average and the half width. So we'd like to see both of those in that plus minus notation from this modified experiment. So tell us how many uh, total replications you needed and then uh, confirm to us that you have now narrowed that confidence interval so that you are pretty confident about where that mean is within um, these uh, specifications. And that is the end of the lab experience. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us, post something on the discussion boards, and look out for some additional videos. Uh, I plan on uh, posting some videos on how to use the process analyzer and maybe a little bit of how to use OptQuest. And there's already some other videos online uh, on the Canvas site on how to get raw data out of these simulations that you can then uh, take a look at in, say, R or Excel or MATLAB or Jump or whatever your stats tool of choice is.